Father, thank you for your goodness and your mercy. Where would we be without it? And yet, Lord, we're not without it. Your word says that goodness and mercy follows us all the days of our life. In fact, specifically, it follows as if it were hunting us down to overtake us. Lord, I pray today that you would overtake this congregation with your goodness and mercy. I pray that your love, Lord, would be evident today. I pray that you would be glorified in these few moments as we consider your word. Lord God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the foundation that it is. It's the, the one solid truth in this world of lies. We thank you, Lord God, for your word, and I pray right now that you will anoint me to speak it, anoint us all to hear it and receive it. In Jesus' name, somebody say amen. amen. It's the red letter edition still. We've been studying the words of Jesus specifically now for three and a half months. Truth told, we could focus on the red letters alone for years and still not cover everything Jesus said. Now, we'll continue this series for a while yet, but today I wanted to pause with it and consider, if, what if we were asked to break it all down, everything Jesus said? If we, what if we were asked to take everything Jesus said and put it in a single message, what would be the gospel's bottom line? We've already said that, that all of these very many things, we, we could go on for years studying the words of Jesus and not cover it all, but there's got to be a way to bring it down so that it's simple. Well, there is. And as a matter of fact, Jesus himself helps us with this. By his own words shows us how simple the gospel really is. In one place in the Bible, in one of the lengthy discussions between Jesus and the religious leaders of his day, and there were a lot of those, because they didn't believe him. They didn't believe in him, and they didn't believe the words he said. But in one of those instances, there was one man, a scribe, who asked the very same question of Jesus that we're asking this morning. What is the bottom line? It's in Mark chapter 12 that we get Jesus' answer. Then one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? Jesus answered him. The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your mind and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second, like it, is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Next so the scribe said to him, well said, teacher, you have spoken the truth, for there is one God, and there is no other but he, and to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the soul, and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is more than the, all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Now when Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. What is the gospel's bottom line? Love God with everything in you and love others as you love yourself. That's the bottom line of the gospel. If we were to break it down to make it simple, we'll just do it exactly the way Jesus did. Love God, love others. Let's begin by loving God with everything in us. Verse 30 of what we just read, it was Jesus again said, And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. In the human heart, in the human mind, love is an idea with many facets. It comes and goes in varying degrees. It has Many different expressions love does, and love is interpreted through many lenses of human experience. 
For somebody that was raised in a loving family, love is an easy thing to relate to. For someone who didn't have that experience, love is a concept hard to fathom. There are many human experiences that become the lenses through which we view love. And so it gets defined in many, many different ways. But Jesus does not leave the idea of loving God to personal interpretation. Jesus is very specific and detailed, starting with the word love itself. Love comes from a Hebrew word that literally means to esteem with passionate warmth of affection. There, there's, there's just, there's no getting around what Jesus is mean, what he means when he says to love God with everything in you. To esteem with passionate warmth of affection. We're not talking about some generic use of the word love here, as in when, when, when one would say, I love a long walk on a warm afternoon. Or, I love a sweet potato pie latte from Big B. This is the kind of love that is not used in a generic form saying that I like something or that I appreciate something or that I enjoy something. Uh, this, is, this is the kind of love that says, you're the top of my list. There's nothing or no one that I love more. As Jesus said to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is not a dispassionate use of the word love. The word and the concept of love are too often used so cheaply in our expressions. But Jesus tells us and shows us by his own death upon the cross, there's nothing cheap, there's nothing dispassionate about love where God is concerned. He doesn't consider us and go, oh yeah, I love them. Yeah, they're all right. No. He loves you with such intensity. He loves you in the way that he calls us to love him. And by the way, God knows those who love him. The Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 8 and 3, but if anyone loves God, this one is known by him. Listen, you can't fall through the cracks with God no matter what. But God knows those who love him. And it's not that he just knows about you or that he knows you simply exist or that you're out there somewhere. Oh, he knows. He knows and he loves with great affection. Of course, loving God in this way is only possible because God loved us first. 1 John 4 and 19 says we love him because he first loved us. If God didn't first love us, we would not know how to define love correctly. We, it would be misinterpreted over and over, misdefined over and over again. If God had not loved us first, we would not have a true concept of love that we could embrace that we could relate to. We are only able to love God in return because He first loved us. Here's how we know that God loving us isn't a cheap love. Romans 5 and 8, but God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't wait for you to get it worked out. He didn't wait for you to get cleaned up. He didn't wait for you to come to a realization he loved you when our hearts were the furthest away from him he loved us enough to spend his only begotten son on us why is the gospel's bottom line to love God with everything in us because when we were unlovable he loved us with everything in him I don't think you even realize how much God loves you. 
You think he loves you because you do things right. You think he loves you because you do good works. You think he loves you because you have the right attitude for five days in a row. (laughs) If you do that, please teach me. God loves you before you even cared about him. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. Love him with everything in you. That's the first part of the bottom line of the gospel. Then comes part two. Loving God is also expressed when you love others like it's you you're loving on. Verse 31, and the second like it is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Hey, by the way, it's the same word for love. To esteem with passionate warmth of affection. Not just to God, but to others as well. To the same degree that we love ourselves. Now, I know that some people struggle to love themselves. The reflection in their mirror is a picture of their failures, their mistakes, and their regrets. And for those people, I've got good news. Jesus invites you to a clean slate. He invites you to a reset. He invites you to a transformation where you can love yourself in a healthy way and see yourself the way that God sees you, as a new creation. To those who struggle to love themselves, I want you to know that you are not the exception to God's rule. He loves you as much as he loves the most perfect saint. He loves you to the same degree. So if you're struggling to love yourself, you need to see yourself the way God sees you. That being said, though, talking about The bottom line of the gospel, we know that most people take pretty good care of themselves. They pursue the things they desire. We we see to it that our own personal needs are met. We eat the food we want. We wear the clothes we want. We hang with the people that make us feel good. Generally speaking, we look after ourselves, don't we? Loving our neighbor means to do the same thing for other people to care about their needs, their dreams, their goals, and to involve ourselves in their lives with the intent that some way, somehow, my presence in your life will make your life better. A lot of people like to insert themselves in other people's lives to make their life a challenge. But God calls us to insert ourselves in people's lives to make their life better. Loving others as we love ourselves is a selfless and sacrificial love. As a matter of fact, Jesus elaborates on this elsewhere, and he even sets the bar higher in John 13 and 34. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you. That's even, that's even stronger than loving our neighbors as ourselves. That you also love one another by This all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. How many know, without looking around this morning, that there are some people that are hard to love? How many of us know that before Jesus we also were hard to love? I'm not really sure how I'm going to take that, but. (laughs) To love others as Jesus has loved us is the pinnacle of selflessness and sacrifice. You know, you don't have to agree with them to love them. You don't have to hold the same opinions to love them. You don't have to come out of the same culture to love them. You don't have to agree with everything they do, with everything they say, 
to love them. Jesus just said, as I have loved you, out of your many tribes and tongues and languages and peoples, out of your many cultures and life experiences, as I have loved you, love one another. God did not send his son into the world to condemn it, but to save it. So our message should not be a message of condemnation, but of love. And our message is going to have to be backed by a tangible expression of love if it's going to make a difference in the lives of the unlovable. You can tell somebody Jesus loves them all day long, but if they feel your hate, they're not going to believe you. You don't have to say you hate them for them to feel your hate. They know it when you're not looking them straight in the eye. When you're trying to avoid the space they're walking in. There's going to have to be tangible expressions of our love if our message is going to have any influence upon their lives. At the very least, believers should love one another. I mean, even Jesus said, they'll know you are my disciples if you bite and devour one another. (laughs) Seems to me that that's what the American church believes. They will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Romans 13 and 8, Paul says, Owe no man anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. Even Peter, the hottest hothead in the group of Jesus' disciples, said the same thing in 1 Peter 4 and 8, Above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. Love doesn't coddle sin. Because sin destroys lives. But while love addresses sin in another person, it does so quietly and compassionately. It's human nature, apparently, to expose and uncover. To tell everyone we know what we found out about another person. But it's gospel to cover a multitude of sins with love. What's the gospel's bottom line? Love God with everything in us and love others like it's you you're loving on. But there's one more thing I want to look at from that same portion of Scripture in that same discussion Jesus was having. And I want to tell you this morning that not far is not far enough. Let me tell you what I mean. When Jesus answered this scribe who had asked him, His question, what is the greatest commandment? The scribe was pleased with Jesus' answer and affirmed vocally that what Jesus said was correct and that moved the Lord. And Jesus said in verse 34, now when Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Man, you're close. So close. But as they say, close only counts in horseshoes and hand grenades. The scribe loved God according to the law of Moses, according to the old covenant. Jesus came as the author of a new covenant that replaces the old and that fulfills the requirements of the old. I remember as I was sitting at my desk this week writing, I sat at my desk literally found myself asking God with tears in my eyes, did this scribe find salvation through faith in Jesus Christ? The Bible doesn't tell us. We don't know. We won't won't know. But I found myself, because Jesus says, you're not far, but not far is not far enough. My point here is that it's not enough to be nearby in the vicinity, associated with the church or with church people. Not far is still too far away. To love God in a generic sense isn't enough. Yeah, I love God. He's a nice guy. You know? 
to love others simply out of a basic respect for their humanity isn't enough. There were many who came close to faith in Christ, but they never made the last step, never came all the way into a personal relationship with Jesus. With all my heart, I pray that that scribe did. But there was one other, a rich young man, who came to Jesus and asked what he must do to inherit eternal life. And he by the way, was a very religious-minded man because he had kept all the old covenant rules since he was a boy. And Jesus responded to him in Matthew chapter 10, looking at him, loved him, and said to him, one thing you lack. Go your way, sell whatever you have, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Come, take up the cross and follow me. But... He was sad at this word and went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Some people like to use this verse as a, a, a point that, that possessions and wealth are a great evil. That's not the message here. It wasn't about this man's possessions. It was about what this man loved. It's about what he loved. He came up to the line. He liked what he saw and heard in Jesus, perhaps even loved Jesus, but in the end loved his possessions more. Not far from the kingdom of God is still too far. You don't get kingdom brownie points for associating with Christians, for being nearby where you hear the word once in a while. Not far is still too far away. Close doesn't inherit eternal life. One more example, and I'll close this message. In the book of Acts, Paul was a prisoner before King Agrippa. He was a prisoner for preaching the gospel. King Agrippa was familiar with the law of Moses and familiar with the prophets who foretold of the Messiah. And Paul asked him, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do believe. Then Agrippa said to Paul, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. And Paul said, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me today might become both almost and altogether such as I am, except for these chains. Almost, close, not far, right on the edge, at the threshold, but still not in. The bottom line of the gospel is to love God and to love others, and we have find the ability to do these things in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Come all the way in. Don't stop short. Don't, don't be, feel good about yourself because you had the right answer at the right time like the scribe because you agree with some things that Jesus says. That's not close enough. Come in all the way into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ because you inherit eternal life by coming into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You learn to love God by coming in to a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You learn how to love others the way you love yourself by coming into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. If you're towing the line but not crossing it, you're still still too far away. If you have a mindset that someday I'll get there, that it's an option for my life, and I even intend that there will day, come a day in my life that I'll cross over into that relationship, who guaranteed that you have another opportunity to tow that line? Come in all the way. I... I I read these examples, the scribe that came to him, God, I pray that his heart was open. I pray, I pray that some way, somehow, he saw the gospel. Lord, I pray that somehow that rich young ruler had a change of heart. 
at some later stage in his life, and, and, and when he, he went away sorrowful, but then realized what he went away from and came back some way, somehow. Lord, I pray that King Agrippa, who knew and was almost persuaded, would not walk away without yielding to the love of God. Hey, it's not God's condemnation that saves you, it's His goodness. It's not, it's not God's judgment that we're offering you this morning. It's His eternal love. But if His love is going to have any effect in your life, you've got to cooperate with it. You've got to receive it. Because God won't make you do anything. God won't force Himself on you. Oh, He'll come by and He'll make Himself known to you and He'll make the invitation. But if you say no or not now or maybe later... He'll let you make the decision you want to make. Not far is not far enough. This close is not close enough. What on this world is keeping you from making that decision? What promise do you find in this life greater than the one you find in Jesus Christ that would keep you Nearby, but not altogether in. Who promised you the world that would make you say, no, I, I think I'd rather pursue these other things. Jesus, maybe I'll get back to you later. I like some of the things you say. I even like some of your people. But I got other things to do. The hour is growing late. And it's time to come all the way in. As much as I love when you attend regularly and come and you're a part of overflow, it's not even about your attendance at church. It's not even that you can quote what I preached. It's about what did you do with Jesus. When we stand before God, that's the only thing that he's going to ask, what did you do with Jesus? There's going to be a group that says, man, in your name we did all these marvelous things. And he's going to say, I don't know who you are. Because there's a whole lot of people out there doing things in the name of Jesus that don't know Jesus. Don't be one of them. Don't be one of them. Come into personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And you will learn what love is all about. Would you stand with me this morning?